And joining us today is former Deputy Staff Secretary under President Bill Clinton, David Goodfriend. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to have you. Are you in a car you. right now? I don't think I am. Gonna... This is uh, this is gridlock in Washington. Yeah. Right now, yeah. it's uh, not traffic, not moving, and I'm in a car. And no, I'm it stuck. looks great. You're committed. We love it. You know we do. <laughs> So first question to you, is Marco Rubio uh, basically the biggest loser thus far? Well, I think his hopes of being the savior of the establishment wing of the Republican Party are probably dashed. It's interesting, I was just talking to um, a colleague of mine who's a Democrat from Ohio, and he had an interesting idea that I just will float by you. He said, right now, if John Kasich were to announce that Marco Rubio will be his vice presidential candidate, and of course Rubio goes along with this, that the two of them put together could uh, have enough votes to come out ahead in Ohio and Florida respectively. They'd make news, they'd band together, they'd uh, call upon their supporters to join together. Um, but I don't, I, I think that's a great idea and I just don't see it happening yeah, I don't, think, I don't see that either. I don't think he went into this thinking that he was going to go for second place by any stretch of the imagination. No, but but it could it could be that he ends up being, um, you know, at least we've seen this happen in prior presidential races where somebody loses in a primary but then pops up as a, as a viable choice as a VP candidate. That's how George H.W. Bush got his job as uh, Ronald Reagan's vice president, after all. It's not implausible, but I do think the end is, of the road is here for Marco Rubio as uh, any, any hope of being the nominee. It, I mean, it, that's, that's definitely a long shot, uh, mm -hmm. seeing John Kasich as the presidential nominee and then Marco Rubio. He could be looking for a job, though, considering uh, his prospects that are out there right now. But we also yeah. want to talk about uh, the situation in Florida uh, with Donald Trump. Way out in front of the polls on Marco Rubio on this. How did Marco Rubio let this happen, David? Well, um, it's been my impression of Marco Rubio as a United States senator. You know, I, I, here in Washington, I spend a lot of time uh, working with the Commerce Committee, where Senator Rubio is a member. Uh, I spend a lot of time w walking the halls of Congress. Senator Rubio, it struck me, was almost always running for president and rarely working on filling potholes back home in Florida. And I don't think his support in Florida runs very deep. I don't think he's been a senator long enough for them to feel a kind of connection to him that, say, they might have felt towards uh, Bill Nelson or Connie Mack or Bob Graham or some of these other longtime statewide Florida politicians. So I, I would even venture to say that Jeb Bush would have done better in Florida uh, than Marco Rubio is going to do. And I think a lot of it has to do, again, with the, the lack of, of tending to the home fields when he was United States senator. Yeah, so we yeah. know there's this meeting today, too, with uh, Jeb Bush meeting with Rubio, meeting with John Kasich, meeting with Ted Cruz. Uh, if you could guess as to what he is going to tell these folks, what do you think he might say? Well, I think Jeb Bush's biggest uh, enemy right now in his mind is Donald Trump. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he's concluded that if Trump had not been in the race, he, Jeb Bush, might have fared better. So perhaps he's talking to these candidates about ways to counteract the Trump phenomenon in Florida. Although I'm not, I'm not convinced personally that, that Jeb Bush is... Uh, popularity in Florida today is what it was at the peak of his popularity when he was governor. I'm not sure he's the best advisor in these particular times when there is so much anger and disenchantment with the establishment on both sides of the aisle, quite frankly. I don't know if Jeb Bush would be my number one choice for a political consultant in these times, but I'll bet that's what he's talking about. Well, you know, we were talking about uh, uh, polls, and right now you mentioned uh, Rubio's popularity because obviously uh, Trump is surpassing him by a pretty large margin when it comes to Florida. But, you know, Michigan, that was supposed to easily go right. to Clinton, and it didn't. So is, it, is there a possibility that these polls could be wrong? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but I think, um, look... Bernie Sanders is a candidate uh, who's shown incredible resilience, and Marco Rubio is kind of the opposite. It's like the further yeah. along he, the less resilience he shows. Mm -hmm. And so I think it would be really unlikely, even if the polls are wrong, that somehow Marco Rubio surprises us by being like a cork who pops up to the surface. A lot of us, including myself, a Clinton supporter, would not surprise at the resilience and strong showing of Bernie Sanders in a Rust Belt state like Michigan. What are you expecting during tonight's debate? 
Well, I, I guess I would I would expect something like what we saw uh, in, in the in the last debate, although I, I have to tell you, um, I'm not a Republican, but I want to see a strong Republican Party vying for, you know, the vast majority of American votes, because I think that's what's best for the, the country when we have two strong political parties vying for the uh, the independents uh, in the middle. And I'm, I'm hoping that we see a little bit more of a measured uh, substantive debate than what we saw last time. I think if, if Donald Trump, which I believe he is, if Donald Trump is going to start to pivot and, and start focusing on what a general election theme might look like, try to act a little mm -hmm. more moderate, okay. try to speak to some of those swing voters, then I think uh, we may see some more substance come out of these debates. At least I hope so, because the Republican Party deserves better than what they've gotten in the last couple of debates. I really believe that. Yeah, I think, I guess there's been a, a talking to with the candidates and their campaigns from Reince Priebus, toning it down a little bit, at least any references to executive branches. I stole that from Stephen Colbert. That's the joke of the week anyway. <laughs> uh, all right, David, stick around. We got more to come. We want to talk to you about Hillary Clinton and the debate performance she gave last night. Yeah, debate moderator confronted Hillary Clinton on the big question, will she drop out of the race if she's indicted what she says now what she said back then and what will any of this mean as we go forward and house speaker paul ryan says no to running for president we'll explain during today's headlines stick around Welcome back to Newsmax Now. I'm Miranda Kahn. Topping your headlines, House Speaker Paul Ryan doesn't want to be president, and he means it. His political organization sent a cease and desist letter to a group that's trying to draft him as a Republican presidential candidate. Coming to a bookstore near you this January, a new book about Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. From who else but the notorious RBG herself. California may raise its smoking age to 21. The state Senate banned, handed the bill rather to the governor for approval. If passed, it would also ban e-cigs from areas where traditional smoking is prohibited. A reminder to be safe on the roads. Take a look at this dash cam video. It captured the moments of a white car turning too early right there. Oof, yeah, you see that? And violently crashing into another. It happened close to D.C. Wow. Let's get back to politics now. It's been one year since we first heard from Hillary Clinton about a private email server. And it was revealed that that's dogged her camp after that revelation. Rather, it's dogged her campaign for presidency ever since. During the debate last night, Clinton refused to answer questions about her emails. This was her response when moderator Jorge Ramos asked her if she will drop out should she be indicted. Oh, for goodness, that is not going to happen. I'm not even answering that question. Well, there was also this moment here when they played a clip showing Patricia Smith, the mother of Sean Smith, who was killed in Benghazi. Smith calls Clinton a liar in the video and blames her for the terrorist attacks, or, bl or cl blames Clinton for lying because she said the attacks were based on the video. Here's Clinton's response. I feel a great deal of sympathy for the families of the four brave Americans that we lost at Benghazi. And I certainly can't even imagine the grief that she has for losing her son. But she's wrong. She's absolutely wrong. Clinton says the Obama administration was just working with the information they had at the time. And rejoining us for part two of our roundtable, David Goodfriend, the former deputy staff secretary under President Bill Clinton. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, David, let's hear your reaction to those two questions that uh, John just introed to last night. Well, well, first of all, I'm sticking around because traffic here in D.C. isn't going anywhere, so I'm stuck. I'll stay Kind of like the, the parties, right? You know, gridlock. <laughs> um, but getting to the issue of uh, uh, the debate, listen, I, I think that Hillary Clinton has done a, a very honorable job of answering the questions, spending 11 hours in front of the Benghazi committee giving every document over to the State Department, the FBI, the Department of Justice. And I think the frustration you heard in her voice and the cheers that you heard from the audience reflect that, you know what, guys, this stuff has been asked and let the chips fall where they may. We're I just wonder, though, David, I wonder, I wonder how that kind of answer is going to play during a general election. You know, I, I you know, she, mm. she rightly yeah. said she, she well, sympathized. Let's, well, let's, let's talk about that, yeah. because by the time the general election rolls around, 
the FBI either will have decided to act or have decided not to act, the Department of Justice rather. And I think by that time, anybody who brings up this topic, if the Department of Justice doesn't bring the case, anybody who brings up this topic is just trying to score additional political points and beat a dead horse. And that, that will justify, I think, the American people's reaction, or as Bernie Sanders said once in one debate, the people are tired of hearing about your damn emails. Well, you're damn right they are. And I think in this case, I think w the Republican Party would be wise to look for another angle. You've beaten on this quite enough, and it hasn't really done much to dent Hillary Clinton's ability to win the nomination, and I think win the general election. It's asked and answered. Let the chips fall where they may. Let's see what the Department of Justice does with the evidence they've gathered. But would it sound and, different, because uh, John's brought this up a couple times on this show, would it sound any different if Bernie Sanders were to go there? If Bernie Sanders were to, to bring up the emails? Yeah. No, I, I, I think, as a matter of fact, the reason he, he hasn't is because he knows that would backfire with Democrats who think this is a political witch hunt, quite frankly. I think it would be a bad strategy for him, and, I, and he knows it. But, but listen, I, I would love to hear a Republican, any Republican, say, I respect the law enforcement judgment of the Department of Justice and whatever decision they make, I will support. The reason you're not hearing that, by the way, in my opinion, is because they don't intend to respect the Department of Justice. They intend to say, aha, even if the Department of Justice didn't bring a case, there must be something there. We're going to keep talking about it. And you mark my words, I've, I've been with the Clintons a long time. The American people will grow tired of that, and it, and it will backfire, as it always has when you overplay your hand. I'd much rather see Republicans say, let's talk about your health care ideas, let's talk about your national security ideas, let's talk about your job creation ideas, let's talk about ideas. Take her on. Absolutely. That's a fight I think we'd all like to see, because th those are the issues. But come on, man. Hammering on this thing again is not getting you anywhere that you haven't gotten already. And that, that ain't very far. She's right. going to be the nominee, in my opinion. I don't and think that Jorge, I don't do think Jorge Ramos would, would have asked those two questions if he did not feel like uh, there was some sort of appetite for the answer that has yet to been given by Hillary Clinton out there. I mean, you know, you mentioned this. I, I, I partly agree with you, David. Democratic voters don't really have much more of an appetite for this. I, I do think there are some folks who want to know what really happened and, and see if she can get better at answering the question. But you heard the audience gasp and boo when those questions were even asked last night. I don't know. We'll see what goes, yeah. see where it goes from here. I do want to talk about head-to-head -head matchups a little bit, too, uh, involving Hillary Clinton. Karl Rove has a piece out in the Wall Street Journal today uh, that takes a look at Donald Trump in head-to-head -head matchups, and he talks about a lot of polls, even though Donald Trump says he's beating Hillary Clinton, do show Donald Trump as the only Republican presidential candidate who cannot beat Hillary Clinton in some pretty important states, places like Virginia, places like North Carolina, uh, and, and elsewhere. So, are you secretly wishing for a Donald Trump nomination here, David? Do you feel like he is the most beatable out of all the Republicans for your candidate to run against? Well, look, for, first of all, Karl Rove has gotten some pretty big things wrong. <laughs> this is true. Karl Rove is, was totally wrong uh, about 2012, uh, you know, he, but he, he's, he's pointing to facts that are poll numbers, aggregate polls, averages and things like I, that. So look, forget forget Karl Rove ever wrote that. Okay. But we'll just talk about the poll numbers that he cited because he's probably not right. helping anybody else other than Donald Trump by bringing that up. But are you wishing, hoping, dreaming that Donald Trump is the candidate that your Democratic nominee runs up against? Look, I think the electoral map favors the Democratic nominee this year, whether it's Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. But, but admit it, David, you would like to see the Democratic nominee run against him the most. Well, I, I think my candidate, Hillary Clinton, can beat Donald Trump and can beat Ted Cruz. Whether I think that, that he's some sort of dream candidate, look, Bill Clinton himself, my former boss, said this will be tough if he's the nominee and Hillary's the nominee. Don't think that this is going to be some sort of easy <laughs> role. This will be a tough fight. Don't take anything for granted. I, I believe that. Look, Donald Trump has brought out new voters. He's got a lot of enthusiasm among the core base of the Republican Party and among uh, uh, some of the more disaffected voters in the Republican Party. Don't underestimate that. Don't make me but Mika Brzezinski you. Ah. And, and cut, you know, you're not answering my question. Yes or no, is he the most beatable out of all the Republicans from your standpoint as a Democrat? He's beatable. Probably the most beatable. Okay. But Ted Cruz is beatable, too. All right. Ted Cruz, He's just thankful, uh, though, that Kasich isn't going to join him on the ticket. Or, We've I, heard I there's a commercial oh, listen, involving I, David Goodfriend talking about John right, Kasich. We've right. heard about that I a couple of times. Guys, 
I told you guys this on your show on Newsmax. I you guys asked me, yes, which Republican fear most, and I said John Kasich, and it made it onto a Kasich commercial. I know. Yes, we, we know. We're, we're happy we could help you out, David, as always. <laughs> and thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us from your car. I hope you're not. I hope you're pulled over. You're not even. It looks really good. I like it. It does. Got yeah. a nice signal there. Yeah. All right. For the first time since 1997, a Canadian prime minister makes an official visit to the U.S. Coming up next, what the president and the newly elected leader discussed and why it matters to America's future. Plus, we still want to hear from you. Tweet us your thoughts at Newsmax now or leave us a comment on our Facebook page. We'll air some of your comments coming up later.